John, uh, we're being joined this week by someone we think always has something on his mind. Come on, we know he always has something on his mind. Sandy Old is former general manager and also former president of the New York Mets. Yes, looking forward to this. One of our favorite guests, not only because he uh, was our guest for our biggest podcast, at least by the numbers so far, I think, uh, should be terrific. We got a lot to talk to him about. Yeah, we will ask him all the uh, pertinent questions about the owner of the Mets, Steve Cohn, the now former general manager of the Mets, Billy Epler, and what was going on with that Phantom IL, Buck Showalter, Pete Alonzo, and more. We'll play hit and error at the end. We'll look at the first quarter of the season for the two New York teams. If you stick with us on the show with Joel Sherman and John Hamer. John, it snap of the fingers, it happens quick, right? We're at the one quarter mark of the season. Uh, every team pretty much has played 40, 41, 42 games in that area, uh, including our two New York teams. Uh, and so I wondered if we could kind of just go over it real quickly. Why don't we, we start with the Mets? Uh, they're a game under 500. They're kind of, you know, Adam Adovino said the other day to me, we are where we should be. They, I think they've scored one more run than they've allowed. They've had good runs of starting pitching, bad runs of starting pitching, good hitting, bad hitting. They're kind of at 500. The race isn't getting away from them. They're only one out of the last wild card. Braves and the Phillies are kind of in the distance a little bit. Quarter into the season, what do you think of this group? Yeah, I'm going to look at it as kind of a half full episode, uh, you know, uh, Glass. Uh, I think they're probably better than a 500 team. They, I think they got room to go. And if you look at it, Right now, if you look at those standings, they're only a game out of the playoffs right now as we speak, right? And, and I don't think we can say that they've played to their full extent, that they reached their potential, right? I mean, Alonzo's got more in them. Obviously, Lindor does. He, they've had moments, but overall, they, they've been better in the past. Uh, I think Beatty is going to be better. He's shown that he's pretty good defensively. I, you would hope McNeil's going to be better. Uh, I think overall, the offense is going to be better with J.D. Martinez. And I think we've learned something about the bullpen, which is much better than we would have thought, right? I mean, not only Adovino been good, Lopez has been good, Reed Garrett's been really good, Diaz maybe not quite as good as he was two years ago, but he's been very good. So the bullpen has been excellent. They haven't had Senga. They just got Martinez, and they haven't gotten uh, their two top players playing the way that they can. So. Uh, I think they got a good shot at the playoffs. I didn't pick them for the playoffs. I think they got a good shot. Yeah, I didn't pick them either, John. And I'm with you. They have ceiling here. I think you hit on most of it. Uh, you know, if J.D. Martinez gets into a groove, we're talking about a guy who averaged nearly an RBI a game last season when he played. Um, you know, Alonzo in particular feels like he has a lot more to give. Is Christian Scott a real guy? You know, and do they get Senga back? And if they get him back, does he look anything like he did for the last four months last season when he pitched like a Cy Young contender and like like an ace? If they do, I think their ceiling raises considerably to that kind of mid to upper 80s. And to your point, you know, they're sitting at 19 and 20. They're, they're a game out of a wild card. Uh, you know, they're not going to catch the Phillies and Braves. Uh, I think the Padres might be good enough to be the second wild card and separate a little bit. But that third wild card is going to be a jumble, just like it was last year. And they have some ceiling to go, including some prospects to trade. If they want to go in that direction, come late July and be seller uh, buyers this season, as opposed to sellers. So I think they have room to grow where maybe some of these other teams that are in this, I think the Diamondbacks have room to grow, but I don't think the Giants do by much. You well, know, because their injuries, lineup is so right? weak. Yeah, they got you know? a lot of injuries right yeah. now. So they're, they're they're kind of in trouble, uh, yeah. I think. So, I, you know, I think they're in a, I think they're in a decent situation. I, I, I'm a little second bit surprised. Second place team in the uh, NL Central. Can they play as well? Who's ever going to finish second in the NL Central? That feels to me like yeah. where the other wild card might come from, the third one. Right, round. and if they get there, they can repeat what the Diamondbacks did. I mean, the Diamondbacks weren't as good as the, the Braves, uh, the Phillies, and the Dodgers, and neither are the 2024 Mets, but you get in, you never know what could happen. So, and and they look like they got a decent shot to get in. So, yeah, I'm mean, gonna say great, but pretty decent. Yeah, I think they're a rung below what it's going to take right now with a chance to grow. Conversely, the Yankees have the second best record in the American League. 
accomplished without a pitch being thrown this year by the best pitcher in the sport. The guy who won the AL Cy Young Award last year, Garrett Cole. I think if we would have had Brian Cashman or Aaron Boone in front of us on March 28th and said, you're not going to have a pitch thrown by Cole until probably about mid-June, would you take this? They'd say, where do we sign up? John, what do you think of the group? Great start. I mean, Soto has been everything you expect him to be. Verdugo's been more than you'd expect him to be. They've got a healthy Rizzo, a healthy Stanton. Are they, you know, prime Rizzo, prime Stanton? No, but they're certainly uh, helpful players, right? And now Judge is back and playing. You, you got that combination of Soto and Judge. That's pretty tough. And the pitching. I mean, look, the, their ERA is a 3-1-0, which is only bettered by the Red Sox, shockingly enough. It's really good. Matt Blake does a great job with the pitchers. The bullpen uh, last night, notwithstanding, has uh, been very, very good. And the starting pitching has been really good, particularly the four and five starters, right? Schmidt and Heal have been really great. I mean, they've I, been I, one, two, not four, right. five. I mean, you could see court, you could see the potential certainly with Rodon and Cortez, uh, but Heal and Schmidt, uh, right. One and two. They've been their two best pitchers. Yeah, you know, there's some underlying numbers on the pitching across the board, especially walk numbers. Uh, you know, I think Matt Blake talked about that with us on when he was on the podcast, the Yankee pitching coach, that are worrisome that they probably won't pitch as well moving forward, but they are going to get Cole back probably, which should help the overall group. I, again, I think they have room to grow, right? It doesn't seem like much, but Tommy Canely, who I'm not a huge fan of, he certainly helps lengthen the bullpen. One thing they don't do is strike out enough guys, and they probably need some help against lefty batters, which he gives with his changeup. If LeMayu comes back, plays third base, suddenly your bench has Birdie and Oswaldo Cabrera on it. It's a much more flexible, better bench. They get Cole back. Does Dominguez help them at some point? I don't believe this is Gleyber Torres' offensive game. And I also think there's more... Austin Wells hits the ball as hard as anyone on the Yankees consistently and has walked more than he struck out. I think there's offense to come. I think there's a chance for this. The pitching has carried them to this point, right. mostly. I think there's room for this offense to grow by a grade. Yeah, I think so. I mean, they, they've had some guys have had great performances that I'm not sure they're going to keep up. One of our favorites, uh, Jose Trevino, with a two-home run effort yes. last night. I mean, he's been incredible. Uh, you know, he's supposed to be a great defender, uh, lowest DRA for for pitching ERA over the last several years. So, you know, he's a great defensive player, but I don't think they were expecting this. Uh, Cabrera has been better than expected. I don't know. Is Volpe better than expected? I'm not sure. I think we did expect to see an improvement, which we have seen. So, you know, I'm not sure. I mean, they've been really good, Joe. Look at look at their record, right? They've yeah. been pretty good. So, uh, and I give them, I'm tipping my cap. I think they're a really good team. Are they better than this? I'm, I'm not sure. I think we both picked the Orioles, right? So yeah. uh, we're not shocked that the Orioles are the competition. Uh, I'm a little surprised that the Red Sox have done as well as they've done. But, I mean, the Orioles are a younger team um, and really a lengthier lineup, really. If they call everybody up and they use all these guys uh, that are in the minors, uh, certainly do. But, uh, you know, it's... It, it's going to be a fight for the division, though, because there is a big advantage to win the. I, even though the wild card has made it to the World Series a lot lately, there is a big advantage. Believe me, to, to yes. winning the division, it's not that part is not going to be easy. I don't think. Absolutely, should go for winning the division and play some intra squad games or something to try to stay sharp for those four games. John, I'll just highlight something about the starting pitching that really stood out to me because I, I kind of sensed it. I've been talking about one stat in particular, which is. Them and the Orioles are the last two teams that haven't had a start of fewer than four innings. So, like, none of those blow-up starts where you have to use your whole bullpen and you're messed up for a week. They have that. Do you know they only have two starts all season where a starter has given up more than four runs? And in one of them, Luis Hill gave up five and five, and they played to extra innings. The only real blow-up game was that three-homer game in Camden Yards by Carlos Rodon. Their starting pitchers have done a tremendous job without the Cy Young Award winner of keeping them in the game and not overexposing a bullpen, which I still think because the two lefties aren't great because Hamilton is down a grade from last year. I think the bullpen has been good and the numbers are better than the reality. And I think one of the reasons the numbers are good is Boone gets to use those relievers how he wants because the starters are getting five, six, seven innings pretty consistently 
without the guy we think gets seven innings every time he starts. I think that has been more than anything else a quarter of the way into the season, the key to the team, which is saying something because they have Juan Soto playing like an MVP. Right, absolutely. The rotation has been very solid throughout, including Strowman, who's fit in great. I only mentioned that because there are questions going in about a quirky personality. We haven't seen that. In fact, he and Cole look like they're quite tight. Uh, you know, two smart guys. I don't know. But, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't have predicted that. And, you know, he's fit in nicely. You know, who's really been good is Luke Weaver. Who would have thought? They yeah. signed him for $2 million. I'm like, what are they? Why is he getting a major league deal off of what he did last year? Signed for $2 million. They have an option for the following year. That looks like a great move. They do make great moves in the bullpen. And, you know, I, we got to give Boone credit. Uh, you know, we've, we've mentioned in the past some, you know, strategic mistakes. But, you know, a bullpen is kind of the purview of the manager, and uh, he's really doing a good job with that pen. Certainly helps that he has good arms. But, I mean, he doesn't have Mario Rivera there. He doesn't have the 96 team there. And I think he's doing a, he's doing a nice job. I think he's really growing into that job. I, I really do. And I can see, I can see differences. It, it does take time. I think Men, Mendoza is going to be a very good manager. So do I. I, still, I don't know. Do you still see some – Strategic questions with Mendoza, like yesterday, last night. Uh, you can't let Ozuna take the lead, right? I mean, you got yeah. a base open, right? You got a base open. You got Harris struggling lefty on deck. Now, ultimately, Diekman came in and walked him anyway. But you know, Ozuna had already brought in a run. He's got like forty RBIs. It's like you know, with something Hank Aaron has done. You know, he's basically carrying that team with Riley and Olson and Acuna not playing like that they can. I didn't think he should have pitched to him there. I thought he should have walked him. But, you know, I think Mendoza is going to grow into the job. His personality is fantastic. I think he's going to be great. But, uh, you know, it takes a while. It takes a while. I think Boone is there. I actually think Boone is a very good manager at this point. You know, there's the nicest thing I think I could say about Mendoza, I mean, sincerely, is I think it says a lot about him as a person that when he was a coach and ultimately the bench coach of the Yankees, he subdued. Clearly, he wants to manage in the major leagues. He subdued it because we see as a manager, his personality and baseball knowledge are far greater than he let on as the bench coach of the Yankees. He was personable and always stopped and gave you time if you wanted to talk. But he located it like never kind yeah. of made it look like, oh, let me show you how much smarter I am than Aaron Boone or anyone else. And now as the manager of the team, you're like, wow, this is you were impressive to start with. But this is even more so, or don't you think so? Is like, yeah, yeah, whenever, because he didn't. Whenever do that, I, I was... talk to him now, I'm right. blown away by what he doesn't hold back because he's the lead guy, he doesn't have to hold back. Yeah, because he didn't do that. I was shocked he got all those yeah. interviews, right? Yeah. Cleveland, I think he was probably second there. San Diego, they liked him there. Now they were going to go inside. Uh, so he had three interviews. I'm like, he's the bench coach of an underachieving team. And he's really not out there. We don't see him. He's not getting any publicity. Had this happen, and for whatever reason, it was the right thing because he's really prepared, he's really ready, yeah. personality fantastic. I think great in that clubhouse, uh, which is the the key to the job. I think more than anything. And you know, I'm nitpicking. Uh, you know, I've seen a couple of strategic things, but it's easy for me to sit in the living room and uh, mm -hmm. second guess. I, I think uh, ultimately he's going to be an outstanding manager, and he's already good. Well, he succeeded Buck Showalter as manager of the New York Mets. We'll ask our next guest, Sandy Alderson, about Buck Showalter, what happened with the Phantom IL, and a lot more if you stick with us on the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman. John and I are so happy to be joined by Sandy Alderson, who was an early guest on the, uh, the show. Uh, we always appreciated Sandy joining us. We always appreciated covering Sandy. Sandy, a, a, a place to start. You're involved in baseball for over 40 years. Uh, you are no longer the president of the New York Mets. I want to note, uh, you just did uh, well, part of a podcast called The Cancer Straight Talk, produced by Memorial Sloan Kettering. You talked about kind of uh, your playbook for working through uh, your cancer. So I wonder, just as a place to start, how are you doing? And really, after so many years in baseball, what are you doing these days? Yeah, so <clears throat> thank you for asking. In terms of my health, i um, been uh, cancer-free for two years, um, originally diagnosed in 2015, just after we clinched uh, <clears throat> the postseason uh, and before we actually 
uh, began the postseason. So it's been, uh, you know, over eight years, but um, uh, very thankful for uh, the care I've gotten at Memorial Sloan Catering, as well as uh, just being terribly fortunate. So um, health is good. Um, since uh, leaving the Mets, which for, from a practical standpoint was early in October last year, um, I've really um, taken a step back from baseball. I've done a few things with, uh, you know, a couple of groups that have been sort of sniffing around uh, franchises and uh, doing some other pro bono stuff related to baseball. But um, other than that, uh, staying active with some nonprofits, I'm on the board of a museum in uh, Savannah, which uh, celebrates um, World War II Air Force, uh, which my father was a participant. So um, staying busy. And we just got back from a ocean cruise. So uh, uh, we're keeping ourselves <clears throat> occupied. Sandy, let me echo what uh, Joel said. We're thrilled to have you on again, not only because uh, you had, uh, as far as I know, the most popular podcast that we had uh, in the history of the show, which is something because we've had Steve Cohen on multiple times and Hal Steinbrenner and many others. Uh, Joel likes anybody who's very smart, and I like anybody who's very honest. So you fit both of our criteria, and so we really appreciate uh, you and having you on. Um, you got a low bar. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. <laughs> um, how, how do you look back? I mean, I not to say that you're done, and maybe you're going to take a, a job at some point. You you see, you're healthy now. You seem to be doing well. Uh, but how do you look back on your career? Uh, anything you're particularly proud of? You won the World Series, certainly with the A's. You've been the World Series again. The the most recent with the Mets, 2015, but certainly uh, several other times with Oakland. Uh, and any any regrets you have uh, in your career? Well, look, I uh, <clears throat> it's, it's been a great 40 years or so. Um, I, I got into <clears throat> baseball um, serendipitously, I would say, and um, was fortunate enough to hang around for a long time. Um, <clears throat> certainly the uh, my tenure with the A's, it was 17 years or so. We had we really had some great success there, but I was fortunate to work for a, a great owner, the Haas family. And um, <clears throat> that really set the tone for, you know, how I tried to function and operate in various roles over, you know, a couple of different franchises and with Major League Baseball. Um, <clears throat> there's always uh, uh, regrets. Um, you know, I wish we'd won the World Series in 2015. I think that that team would have been as storied as the 1986 team had we won simply because of the way in which we <clears throat> accelerated uh, through the regular season after the uh, trade deadline with a variety of different new players coming in, many contributions. Um, so certainly that was a highlight. Um you know, outside of uh, my normal duties, I'd say the gold medal in Sydney in 20, uh, 2000 was a highlight. Um, one wouldn't necessarily um, assume that, but it was like a pennant race and a World Series all wrapped up in a two-week period. It was, uh, it was really great. And, of course, you probably know that uh, um, Sean Burroughs, who was on that team, uh, recently passed away. But <clears throat> it's... Uh, a reminder that it's been 20, 24 years since that team was put together in terms of regrets. Um, you know, there, I try not to go back and analyze things I could have done differently. Um, plenty of those things, um, certainly, but, um, um, you know, I wish, we, again, I wish we had won the world series in 2015. Um, and, uh, uh, at the same time coming back with Steve Cohen, you know, in 20, uh, 20, late 2020 was a real opportunity. I uh, will always appreciate the fact that he gave me that opportunity and uh, I was able to be around during that transition period. Um, but uh, um, I don't look back very often. Um, and unfortunately, when I look forward, it's a uh, uh, short horizon. <laughs> <laughs> And the only only half the members of the the show were at the Sydney Olympics in 2020. 
I was in the ballpark when Ben Sheets three hit the uh, Cubans. We had to make a devilish decision that night because Ruling Gardner was beating the uh, great Russian wrestler uh, Karel, and at the exact same time, which are you doing? I stuck with you, Sandy. I stuck with the baseball <laughs> and Ben and Ben Sheets. Um, <laughs> you mentioned uh, Steve Cohn. Uh, there was a sense that uh, you joining him helped was a key in helping him get the team at a time where there were probably other owners who had some strong suspicions about it. I wonder uh, if you think that's accurate. And also, we have some years now. Is Steve Cohn a good owner of a baseball team? Why, why not? Well, <clears throat> yeah, I can't tell you whether uh, my involvement uh, was helpful or not to Steve uh, in, in getting approval for uh, ownership. Um, I was a known commodity at the time. And um, so, you know, it's possible. Um, on the other hand, the way things went and some of the contracts that uh, came down the pike in the subsequent three years, I'm not sure that uh, I was the uh, stabilizing force that uh, they um, anticipated. Um, I think Steve will be a great owner. I think that, uh, you know, he is uh, totally committed to the team. Um, I think that he has learned a lot over the first three years, both in terms of how to compete as well as how to operate more broadly. Um, and I think that, you know, the future is bright for the Mets. Um, and I think that probably the um, <clears throat> reset, if you will, that uh, 2024 represents is a good thing. Um, you know, <clears throat> in the stock market, it's, it's always good. They say it's always good to, for the market to pull back occasionally and uh, um, <clears throat> solidify its gains before moving forward um, further up in the and So I think in, in that sense, Steve has um, <clears throat> learned quite a bit. And um, I think, think that ownership is well positioned going forward, giving his resources and what he's learned over the first three years of his ownership. You mentioned the big contracts, obviously Scherzer, Verlander, there were others. Um, what do you think he's learned from that? And uh, where, where, how well positioned do you think they are? And obviously he had a great year in 22. 23 was a disappointment. As you said, this year looks is a reset. They're doing okay. Um, what, do you, what do you think going forward? Are we going to see those big contracts? Is he going to? You know, I mean, Juan Soto will be out there. There's going to be some big free agents. Um, is he going to dive back in, or did he learn so much that he's going to do something different now? I think, uh, first of all, I think when Steve came in, he understood that to be competitive early on, uh, he was going to have to participate in the free agent market until the uh, farm system was in a position to, you know, sustain – <clears throat> the major league team over a period of time. Um, and so I think that, uh, you know, in that sense, that, that what's, what's happened over the last year or so shouldn't be a surprise. It's a transition from something, um, yes, spectacular, but also somewhat necessary in order to be competitive and um, satisfy expectations. But over the long haul, that sort of approach is probably not sustainable. And um, so I think that, you know, I think that um, uh, there was a learning curve, but Steve's a quick study. And um, I think what you're seeing now uh, is a is setting a foundation for going forward. And, you know, look, they're they're competitive now. It's not as if a uh, team is thrown in the towel. That's not the case at all. So see where it goes the remainder of the season. But I think Steve is being prudent. And uh, at the same time, I fully expect that, He'll utilize whatever resources he has um, at the appropriate time, given his experience and, and what he's learned over the last three years. Uh, Sandy, at the beginning of his administration, look, there was some rough going, right? Jared Porter, Zach Scott. Uh, but there also was concern, I think, about working for him, right? It was hard to ignore that how many people talked about Black Edge and what was in it and their concern from uh, the financial world. Do you think that his ownership to date has shown who he is as an owner? And now, I mean, they, you do, do ultimately hire David Stearns, who's looked at as one of the best and brightest in the business, that people will now be, yes, I trust this. I'll come work 
in New York for the Mets for Steve Cohn? Yeah, I think that uh, I think that's that's the case. Um, I think hiring David Stearns um, was was a um, a big get. As you recall, we made made a lot of uh, <coughs> excuse me effort to hire someone uh, in twenty prior to the twenty two season, um, and it was difficult to do so. I think that bringing David in um, has stabilized things. Um, and I think probably established a certain amount of independence within the baseball operations department. Um, <clears throat> but I think that, uh, you know, Steve will always be Steve. The finance business is a little bit different from the baseball business. Um, but um, I think Steve uh, understands how it's different, but doesn't tolerate, uh, you know, failings where it's similar so um <clears throat> i think that uh i look i think the mets future is is uh definitely um an arrow straight up you know when i introduced you i mentioned how honest you are so i know you were not involved in this but you were there last year so uh i do want to ask you what your perspective is on the uh the fake il uh situation um you know, a lot of people are looking at it as like, well, Billy Epler was punished, but a lot of people do this or everybody does it. I don't know. what What's your perspective? When did you find out about it? What was your perspective on this? Yeah, look, I <clears throat> I, I don't want to get into a lot of detail, but let me say this. Um, I used the Phantom DL once in my 40 year career back in the late 80s. I can tell you the player who was involved. Uh, I felt terribly about it and never did it again. Um, <clears throat> it is not, in my view, a common practice. And to the extent it is a common practice, it shouldn't be. Um, <clears throat> clearly, there are gray areas with respect to the dis to the injured list. And, um, <clears throat> you know, there are judgment calls that need to be made. But um, uh, in some cases, um, and again, not focusing exclusively on what happened with the Mets, um, you know, the, <clears throat> the injured list was being used improperly, uh, has been used improperly around the league from time to time. But, <clears throat> you know, what disappointed me more than anything else was the re reaction to this in the media, which, was, which is to say nobody was terribly upset about it. Nobody thought it was um, – uh, you know, something that uh, uh, didn't happen all the time. And um, and actually, the only person I, I saw that reacted that way uh, was Zach Scott, who does his own little podcast. But uh, uh, in any event, um, it's not something that I think is widespread and it, it shouldn't be. Uh, <clears throat> and um, uh, so Major League Baseball took action where it thought it needed to. Sandy, obviously this practice bothered you, and I hope you forgive a blunt question, but there is question about how Major League Baseball found out about this. Uh, there was a, a letter sent to them that detailed it, and uh, the sense around the Mets was you were no fan of Billy Epler. Among other things, he dismissed your son from, uh, from the, working in the front office. I'll ask the blunt question. Was this, was this you? No. Absolutely not. Look, if I had wanted to communicate with the commissioner's office, I would have communicated directly to Dan Halem, the commissioner, uh, people I've known for, you know, 20 or 30 years. Um, you know, from my standpoint, um, uh, I thought that uh, issue was behind the Mets, behind us, uh, and had no reason whatsoever to um, write such a letter. But anybody that knows me, um, knows that's not the, the, the um, avenue I would have pursued. Um, was I a big fan of Billy's? No. Um, but um, that's, you know, separate and apart from anything else. So as far as I'm concerned, I, you know, I, I don't think Major League Baseball ever determined who wrote the letter. Um, but, um, and there were things in that letter that uh, I was unaware of. Um, so um, short answer is no. 
you uh, threw one up at the net for me here. You said you were not a fan of uh, Billy's. Um, am I wrong? Do, did you have something to do with the hiring of him? And if and and well, and if so, like, why weren't you a fan? He was on the job there uh, for two years. Why? Why not? Uh, well, look, I was directly involved, and uh, I've I've said to myself and other people, had a, had we to do it over again, I, I I would have hired Billy again, because I think given the situation that we were facing, um, you know, Billy was the right choice. Um, uh, on the other hand, um, you know, over time, um, I became less involved in the baseball operation um, and putting aside anything with my son, um, uh, just um, was more and more distant from the baseball operation. And um, look, people have differences of opinion, different uh, points of view. So, um uh, but you asked me a question, so I gave you an answer. <laughs> you do, you do that. Let, let me ask you this. Did you find out this was going on while you were in that position? And did you do anything to stop it? Uh, I look, I don't, I don't want to get into the details. Um, so. But the answer is yes and yes. Okay. <laughs> John, would you like to ask another one then? <laughs> yeah, you know what? Let's let's ask about that GM search. I mean, obviously it was difficult. I mean, whether it was this, this Steve's reputation, New York, people comfortable, I don't know. Uh, you know, I, I'm just, maybe this is me. Maybe I'm the only one interested, but I'm curious. Uh, the names I'd heard, and the, correct me if I'm wrong, if there were other names, were Antonetti, Forrest. We know Billy Bean was looked at at some point. Stearns was pursued heavily, I think, at different points. And I guess uh, that, you know, Milwaukee just didn't let him interview, which is their prerogative. Uh, and ultimately, he looks like a, a, an excellent choice. Um, were those the names? And did you feel you were ever close on any of them? And, uh, you know, ultimately, what, what do you like about Stearns? Well, uh, yeah, the the names you you just read off or, you know, the usual were, were the were this the typical suspects at that time um a lot of them were under contract so it was difficult to uh, uh talk to any of them we did get permission to talk to one or two um but um uh, you know ultimately that it, it was very difficult to uh uh break through those contractual uh obligations um and we had to respect those um uh, um as well so um so that was, you know, that was, uh, that was difficult, but as I said, um, you know, um, very happy that we were able to hire Billy at the time that we did. Um, as far as, uh, David Stearns is concerned, I think, you know, <clears throat> um, I think he, obviously he's well-respected in the industry, but I think also he's well-respected as an individual and in, in setting the culture uh, in the baseball operations department for the Mets. I think that has been and will continue to be very important. Um, uh, and I think he, you know, what he has done, uh, look, anytime somebody new comes in, they bring in a few of their own people and there are changes that are made, but I think he's, he's been measured about that and, um, doing his best to, uh, figure out, you know, what, uh, to retain from the old regime and, and uh, you know, what needs to be updated or um, improved. So, um, you know, I think he's just, you know, his leadership style is um, uh, very reassuring. And he's obviously a smart guy and articulate. Um, <clears throat> but I think also, you know, he's, he's empathetic. And I, I think that the the operation there. Now, look, I don't talk to anybody there, so it's not like, you know, I have firsthand information, but my sense from having talked to David before he took the job and, um, and observations from a distance, uh, thereafter, I think that, um, I think the organization is in a, uh, great position. Sandy, you, you had to do something like this when you were general manager of the Mets, you had a franchise icon in David Wright and you had to decide, do we go long-term with him? I think, Previously, you had 
discussed the idea of not loving that second contract, the one that takes a player into his 30s. And Wright ended up snosis, not in a great situation. Mets have something similar. Homegrown player, beloved by the fans and Pete Alonso. Um, I'm wondering uh, how involved at all were you along the way here? I, I mentioned it last week. I think he was offered seven years at $158 million at some point last season before the trade deadline uh, and didn't do it. Uh, what, what do you think about his situation? And would you, knowing everything you know about the player and these kind of contracts, would you do everything possible to keep him? You know, that's that's a good question. First of all, um, I try, respect, Sandy. I try. With, with respect to David, um, you know, I thought at the time I, I haven't been a big fan of long term contracts during my career, but you know, signed a few of them, regrettably, uh, in many <laughs> instances. Um, but in David's case, I thought it was important for the Mets to sign David because of the statement it would make to Mets fans. It was about the brand. And I thought that, I thought that, uh, you know, the Wilpon family and the Mets, it was important to sign David um, <clears throat> because I think it was a way to establish or reestablish credibility with the fan base. Um, I'm not sure the same situation exists with respect to Pete. Um, I don't think, I don't think, um, Steve has to do anything to, you know, reestablish or establish or reestablish his credibility as an owner. I think it will be strictly a baseball decision. And, um, you know, I like Pete, I, you know, Pete was a second round draft pick. He's homegrown, as you mentioned, just, you know, been a great representative of the Mets. Um, what they will do, um, my guess is with, you know, David there, uh, there will be, uh, less emotion and more hard realism about um, whether they sign him or not. Um, but clearly, you know, he's somebody the fans enjoy. And if there's anybody given the entire uh, circumstance, including the fact that he's homegrown, et cetera, uh, if there's anybody that, that deserves a long-term deal, Pete, Pete obviously is, is, um, is that guy. So I think, and I think that had an impact, like when Brandon Nimmo signed his contract, um, I think I think Steve recognized the value of you know a homegrown player. So um, we'll see. You you were in charge for uh, both of those picks, Nimmo uh, from Wyoming, uh, now the greatest player ever out of Wyoming, and Alonzo who was picked uh, I think around sixty third or sixty fourth, something like that. So uh, great job by you on that. Uh, right now, they're performing uh, as the two best offensive performers, regulars on the team. Uh, but this team looks a little bit like the 2015 team did at this point, right? That 2015 team was just kind of around 500 for the first, not only quarter of the season, about the first half of the season. How do you know when a team is going to switch from a 500 team and, and make that kind of run? Does this team have it potentially in it? And I, I hate those double questions but since we have you and i'm asking you about the 2015 team uh was wilmer flores really not traded because somebody failed in a physical or was it because he cried it wasn't I because had a chance to ask that before so no it uh, uh wilmer was not traded because uh um somebody else involved in that trade failed okay. the and uh i think it was the one time in my tenure with the Mets that uh, a doctor stepped up and said, no, um, <clears throat> at least in connection with a trade. So, uh, so that's the reason that deal did not go through, but. Um, but how does the team turn it around like that? Go 80 games and be average. And then all of a sudden, you know, I mean, that team had some good elements, you know, Cespedes, Granderson, but nobody saw it coming for the first for three months of the season. Well, we made, you know, we made some acquisitions around the edges. We acquired some relief pitching. We got a couple of, uh, uh, you know, Kelly Johnson and a couple of others before we made the Cespedes trade. So, and we made a couple of deals, I think maybe one deal afterwards, but um, there were probably six or seven new players on the team as of the deadline or thereabouts. Um, as far as predicting that, you know, look, we, 
uh, we traded for Javier Baez uh, in 20, whenever it was, 2021. And um, it, it, the team did not catch fire. So you never know. You know, it, it may work, it may not. But I think in, in, in that case, in 2021, as well as in 2015, we needed to make the effort uh, to try. And, um, you know, as I, as I recall mentioning to Fred and Jeff at the time, you know, this was, again, this was about credibility as an organization. And that's why we made the effort we did. And we were fortunate. I mean, the team just caught fire and uh, was really unbeatable through uh, most of the postseason until the World Series. You know, Sandy, the, if, if you're around the Mets for a long time, you know, a lot of strange things have happened to this organization uh, that are kind of feel more off the beaten path than most. One of them happened late last season. Buck Walter essentially announced his own firing at a press conference. I don't know that I'd ever seen that before. Uh, and then, look, I heard this story. You could tell me if it's part of Mets craziness or not, that after the last game of the season, or maybe even after that game, there was uh, like a bunch of the yet young Met employees were essentially having an end of the season dance party. And it was very loud and not that far from the manager's office. And that the uh, president of the New York Mets, Sandy Alderson, felt that that was not great decorum or show of respect for the guy who was accomplished a lot in that manager's office and went in and uh, let those employees know how he felt. Is that a true story? Uh, not really. <laughs> there, I liked it though. Oh, yeah. There were a few. Is it close? There, <laughs> I think there were a few people in, the, you know, a few young people in the clubhouse who, you know, um, not celebrating the end of the season, but acknowledging the end of the season. Um, so, uh, really, it was it was hardly anything, and um, uh, I I didn't have to get as directly involved as you suggest. So. Okay, my last question about something totally different, the Oakland A's. Uh, you'll be remembered, of course, as the greatest. Well, Billy Bean's pretty good, too. But uh, the, the the guy who made the Oakland A's what they are uh, through analytics and other key moves, obviously, had the Bash brothers, Dave Stewart, Tony La Russa. Uh, it was quite, a, quite an era in Oakland A's baseball. Uh, right now, they're obviously uh, struggling, to put it mildly. Um, you know, it looks like they're going to go to Las Vegas if they're allowed. They may be going to Sacramento in the interim. What do you make of all this? Some people say they just don't have the fans. Others blame the owner. Uh, since you're an honest guy, I thought I'd ask you that. Well, honestly, if you, you want to know the real villain in all of this, it's the San Francisco Giants. Because if you go back to 1992, Walter Haas agreed to cede the San Jose territory to the Giants in order for the Giants to build a new stadium in San Jose. Um, they never built that stadium in San Jose, but they kept the territory. And, um, <clears throat> and as a result, I think, ultimately, um, you know, the A's are moving out of the Bay Area. Were they able to go to San Jose and able to do so, you know, some years ago? Um, I think it would be a very different story. So, um, uh, you know, I can't, I'm not close enough to what's going on there to either be critical or supportive of um, what the A's are doing. But uh, I do know that if you go way back uh, over 25 years ago um, and, you know, to some extent, it, it uh, lies with me and other people who didn't insist on a mechanism to get that territory back, uh, uh, for example. But um, ultimately, uh, if the A's could go to San Jose, it would be a win-win for them and the Bay Area. And uh, unfortunately, they're not able to. Uh, look, as a way to wrap it up, Sandy, I brought up the name Buck Showalter. Uh he was dismissed at the end of last season. He left so at the same time as you. Um, I wonder what you thought of working for him and if you still thought he was near the top of his game and could still do this if somebody wanted him to do it. I'm a big fan of Bucks. Um, 
you know, when Buck was hired, the, there were all kinds of um, not rumors, but, you know, speculation about Buck and how um, uh, how much control he needed, et cetera. Um, I mean, Buck was a team player the entire time he was with the A's. And if anything, I think that Buck wasn't able to um, as freely as he would have liked uh, make decisions on um, players and lineups and things of that sort. So uh, I've got nothing but great things to say about Buck. I think Buck uh, is certainly capable of managing in, in the big leagues again. Um, I'm glad that uh, the Mets hired him, had a great season in 2022. And um, uh, I think he did an excellent job for us. So I'm a big, I'm a big Buck fan. I said I was done, but I, I'd like to follow up on that. You said that you couldn't, as freely as he'd like, make the uh, decisions, including lineup decisions. What, did the lineups come from the front office? Not you, I'm sure, but I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say the lineups came from the front office. Again, let me let me reiterate: I was not involved in baseball operations in 2023, and very little in 2022. Okay, so. Um, <clears throat> So on the other hand, you know, I'm not stupid and, uh, you know, decent observer. And um, I just think that, you know, um, I think that Buck had a situation, faced a situation where he didn't have as much um, flexibility and uh, independence as he would have liked. Well, Sandy, uh, I think John mentioned that uh, your episode was our top rated episode. I think we're about to beat it. Uh, <laughs> so uh, we, we had a lot of lot, lot of road here uh, to cover uh, to sum up, you know, uh, your time with the Mets, your, your, your long distinguished career. And uh, as always, John and I appreciate you joining the show with Joel Sherman and John Hammond. And, and we're obviously thrilled that you're, you're feeling well. Thanks for, uh, for having me on. I've enjoyed it and, um, um, do it again sometime. All Thanks. right, Sandy. Thank, Thank you, you very right. much. We of course, thank Sandy Alderson for joining us on the show. John hit or error. I'm going to take liberty with this and give a hint to you for your oh. documentary, 1990 documentary on the Yankees. I was there in 1990, and I didn't realize how interesting a team this was. And you're right. You have it all set up, all this stuff going on behind the scenes. And I'm really looking. I did an interview for it, but I'm You're really in it, John. Forward. I've seen it. I've all right. It. Great. I'm looking forward to seeing it, uh, Peacock. And congratulations. And a hit goes out to you, Joel Sherman, my uh, my co-podcast uh, her, I guess. Yes, yes John, I, I, I appreciate it. Uh, during the uh, pandemic and the worst of it in 2020, when we didn't have any games, we were all kind of desperate trying to figure out what to, you know, we still put out a edition every day, what to put into it. And I kind of, I've always had the 1990 Yankees on my mind. It was their worst team since 1913, which was literally the first year they were called the Yankees after the Highlanders. Uh, and somehow they were actually worse off the field than on it. And I just started to do some interviews with people. And then I went to our sports editor, Chris Shaw, and I said, Chris, I think I have a series here. And it ended up being an eight-part series. It was over 30,000 words, I believe, close to 35,000 words in all, uh, kind of like a book in three weeks. Uh, and then it got optioned to be a documentary. And uh, it premiered. The first episode was showed at the Paley Center last week. People seemed to really, really like the doc. It's three parts. All three one-hour uh, episodes will drop on Peacock this Thursday, May sixteenth. And uh, the you know once uh, I wrote it, I had very little to do with it after I write it. Uh, DJ Caruso, the director, who's a feature film director, just finished a movie with Anthony Hopkins in Morocco. In fact, uh, did a terrific job uh, taking a lot of information from those thirty-five-ish thousand words. And boiling it down into three uh, one part, ep uh, uh, three one hour episodes, and I I do hope people watch it. Yeah, like I said, I was there. It was my first year, so I was just trying to get by on the beat, probably against yeah. you and uh, Mike K. But uh, you know, looking back on it, a lot did happen. I mean, obviously the Steinbrenner uh, suspension that that st stood out at the time and still stands out. But 
everything that happened to Mel Hall and many of the other characters on the team. A no-hitter where they lost for nothing. Oh, Andy um, Hawkins, right. Who, Deion right. Sanders debating baseball or football. Cougar Cubs. I loved Deion, team. by the way. I, I yes. love the guy. He was Pasquale. bad. I love Mel Hall. I can say that now because he's in prison, but yeah. I didn't like Mel Hall. But boy, Deion was a great guy to cover. Really Pasquale fun. Perez's craziness and some more. Uh, anyway, Peacock. Thursday night, all one, uh, three one-hour episodes will drop. John, I uh, thank you for uh, mentioning it uh, uh, on this. I always thank uh, Jake Brown and Tommy Hogan, Hogan who help us produce this. Don't forget the YouTube uh, New York Post Sports page if you'd like to see the episode. Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts if you'd like to listen. Give us a five-star rating. Uh, drop a review if you'd like. And as always, we appreciate you joining us on the show with Joel Sherman and John Heyman.